and welcome to our Facebook Live event. I'm Christine Herman, health reporter for WILL and Illinois Newsroom. Tonight we'll be talking about what it takes to cultivate resilience and healing in our communities, why it's so important right now, and the role we all have to play. Many of you are joining us after just wrapping up the screening of the documentary Broken Places on WILL TV. Welcome. Even if you haven't seen the film, we invite you to be a part of this conversation tonight and to learn from the panel of local experts we have joining us right now. Karen Sims is a licensed therapist and director of the CU Trauma and Resiliency Initiative. Dr. Malcolm Hill is a retired pediatrician from Carl Hospital and also serves on the board of the CU Trauma and Resiliency Initiative. We're also joined by Katina Wilcher. She's the director of student, family, and community engagement at Unit 4 Schools in Champaign. And Michael Trout is the director of the Infant Parent Institute. All of you, thanks so much for being here tonight and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And you can join our discussion tonight as well by submitting your questions and comments here on Facebook. You can post a comment. Uh, you can also give us a, uh, send us a text message. So we have a new platform through which you can do that. You can just text the word HEALING to 217-803-0730. We'll have that number posted in the comments here in case you missed it. Text the word HEALING to this number. You'll receive a text back about the event and then you can hit reply to send along questions or comments related to what we're discussing tonight for our panel of experts here. So I wanna go ahead and just jump right in and get started with this conversation. Karen, um, let's start off by defining some terms. Um, your organization is called the Trauma and Resiliency Initiative, mm -hmm. which is focused on reducing the harmful impact of trauma on people's lives. When we hear the word trauma, uh, what kinds of things are we talking about? So we use SAMHSA's definition, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and we use their definition because we think it's the most inclusive. So all bad things aren't traumas. Uh, so traumas are, are, are bad things that become so overwhelming that they uh, change how you feel, how you think. Um, how you behave, uh, so they become shaping and defining, and those can be events, experiences, and the effects of those things. So uh, any uh, so trauma is this broader definition. So events like are the things that people tend to think about, like sexual abuse and family violence and those things. But growing up in a household where there's a family member that has a substance abuse need or growing up in a neighborhood that is in a high stress neighborhood where there is a lot of community violence or disruption um, a, um, or the effects of feeling constantly powerless, not having access to resources, having food insecurity or living with constant oppression are, you know, are the shaping and defining experiences that sort of fit within the definition of trauma. And Dr. Malcolm Hill, when, um, the film Broken Places explained a bit about how severe chronic stress actually changes a person's biology. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you can talk about what we know about how trauma affects brain development in babies and young children, um, and even starting as early as in utero during pregnancy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of research that supports that stress, even to a pregnant woman, affects the fetus significantly. Uh, you get these stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, these kind of things that strictly inter it interferes with brain development. So you can see decreased brain growth, decrease in the connectivity of the neurons themselves. A very, you know, a scientific way you can look at this and and we've looked at this because in the first two years of life that's where the majority of the brain growth occurs and so so we're looking at uh significant growth and plasticity of the brain that's being affected by these stress hormones if you will by the toxic stress that can exist and so uh they've actually looked at mris of the brain and and we can see differences um, and going forward, I think that affects how children can behave in the future. Uh, it can affect cognitive development, social development. All those things are extremely important in terms of you know, having a, a successful life, if you will. Um, and so I think that's kind of where we have spent time looking at the science of it. Toxic stress. 
Michael Trout, you're a psychologist specializing in infant mental health with many decades of experience. I'd really like to hear from you about what do we know about both risk factors as well as protective factors for children who experience adversity in early life? Well, protective factors I'll start with. Uh, certain, certainly attachment, which is the thing I've been studying most of my adult life, is the primary um, primary factor that will not insulate a, a baby or a young child, but will certainly mitigate the experience. So if, for example, um, people come crashing into the family's house one night to arrest dad and haul him off to prison, uh, that can easily be a trauma. It can also just easily be a really bad night. And the difference may lie with what else is going on in the family prior to that night, during that night, and after that night. So if, for example, the family has been relatively unchaotic, if mom is still there after dad is hauled away, if mom doesn't fall apart, which she's pretty likely to do, by the way, because her husband has just been taken away and her family may be collapsing, then she is still available uh, to provide the basic needs of this child and reassure the child that love and safety, which are the two biggest things on his mind, are still available. And so it's less likely to be a trauma under those circumstances. It's not just that uh, certain nights are worse than others for, for reasons of noise or chaos in general. It's all those mitigating factors, but particularly the accessibility of a loving caregiver to take the edge off things. So when you say attachment, you're referring to the parent-child bond. That's exactly right. Or somebody, you know, it can be grandma who just happened to pop by that night or a foster mom. It can be dad himself. It can be any number of people upon whom the child knows he can rely. Yeah, I see lots of nodding heads here. Uh, Karen, was there something you wanted to add about whether it's risk factors or protective factors for the effects of adversity in yeah. your life. So this is one of those areas where we know a lot about risk and protective factors. And so I encourage people to pay attention to that. So there are those nurturing, consistent relationships that are can help. Um, but if you think about what creates an environment for a nurturing, consistent relationship, there are a lot of structural supports like having access to food and having a safe neighborhood and having people around you and having supportive relationships. All of those things from beginning to end uh, in terms of what communities can do for families make a difference. I'm gonna just mention one study uh, that, that they're doing in um, New York around uh, reducing maternal stress where at Columbia, they decided because they knew maternal stress causes, can co contribute to all kinds of long-term problems, they gave moms $100 a month extra income. Not a lot, right? Just an extra $100 a month. And they found that it reduced maternal cortisol, which increased the size of babies. It reduced, it made for healthier pregnancies. It um, increased IQ points. $100 a month so moms didn't have to deal with like taking 13 buses and going to a food bank and all of those stressors make a difference and those are all community things. And so if you go to risk and protective factors across the age and stages, the more we have social supports and structural supports and other things in the community, the healthier people are. And the more adversity we put on people, the, the, the worse that bad night sort of compounds. And so I, I, I always like, particularly for a community audience, wanna say everything that we invest in makes a difference. So if we see families as these little islands uh, not connected to systems, we miss the point. Mm. Katina, I wanted to come to you here. I wanted to hear your thoughts on how all of this plays out for children who become school age and enter the school system. You're the director of student, family, and community engagement at Unit 4. How does growing up experiencing and witnessing things um, that can become traumas in your life, um, domestic violence, gun violence in your community, how does that affect children and their 
academic success and their overall success in life. Well, I think um, Dr. Hill alluded to it quite nicely in terms of those traumatic experiences that many of our students often experience, often manifest um, in their learning um, behavior and those significant relationships, right? And there are numerous studies that support um, that young people who have experienced traumatic experiences um, can diminish their ability to concentrate in school, right? Um, their, their working memory, their organizational and language abilities, all of which impact their ultimate academic outcomes. Um, and beyond that, their, their ability to succeed in school and ultimately life. Um, so again, having those trusting relationships um, with caring and trusted adults or others in their lives who wrap around them in ways that are meaningful and supportive, um, we certainly see that in the school, particularly around um, learning ability as well as um, behavior. Yeah, and that's all been made more complicated right now with the COVID-19 pandemic going on and sure. schools being closed as long as they're closed. Um, I just want to remind our audience that you can participate in this conversation tonight. We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty on our Facebook Live with the comments section, but do um, you can text the word healing, and I'm going to repeat the number here to 217-803-0730. That's 217-803-0730. Text the word healing, and you'll get prompted, and you can reply to that with any questions or comments you would like to um, include in our conversation tonight. Um, so the, I want to go the healing. I, I would say, yeah. you know, in COVID, you know, you we've talked a lot about toxic stress, ACEs, which is these adverse childhood experiences, what it does for kids, you know, the success in school, this kind of thing. But also, as these kids grow up, unfortunately, there's a significant impact on these people's health as they grow up to be adults. And we see increased amounts of diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, and guess what? That really impacts the, the ability to uh, deal with COVID-19. So this has huge ramifications, what we're doing now. And I think as Karen says, our whole community needs to be involved with school districts, uh, healthcare, social services, public health, you know, a lot of, we need to get a community going, you know, to really take care of this. This is not just a, a problem can be solved by one group and we've got to work together. I think Karen mentioned that again, I think everybody's doing their thing, but working together is going to be important in coordination. So. Yeah, I definitely I want to make sure. Oh, go ahead. Katina. And I would say I would echo again what Dr. Hill said, because traditionally when we return to school in the fall, we would normally be focused on um, some academic pieces doing review. Um, but I think one of the things we're really clear about is that we can't come back with the same focus as we would traditionally come back with. Um, because of COVID, I mean, we have to really be intentional about the social emotional learning piece across all spaces um, and with our community partners alongside of us. And can I just add, and to think about this as a long-term view, I, I double-checked in The Lancet, which is, you know, a medical publication, said the annual cost of untreated adverse childhood experiences is $581 billion a year in the United States. And those are people who have two or more ACEs. Um, so, Karen, and can, was, can you define what, what ACEs are? So, yeah, so great. So, uh, Short answer is there was a, a study that happened. It was the largest study of its kind. It gets replicated. So you can go to the Center for Disease Control if you want to kind of look at the data. But they, and they started off looking at a pretty middle-class, well-insured group of people. And they found out that certain childhood experiences, things like abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, growing up in a household with a family member who has a mental health need, growing up in a household where there's a substance abuse problem, growing up in a household where there's a parent outside of the house um, who perhaps is incarcerated. Um, uh, and again, abuse and neglect, because we forget about how, how, how damaging neglect can be, even neglect that isn't intentional, just because maybe you work three jobs and you're not available, right? Um, but having those adverse experiences um, become shaping and defining. Uh, the more you have, the more um, the the more correlation with adverse health outcomes. So the top ten causes of death 
and even COVID makes this apparently clear, the top 10 causes of death are associated with having four or more ACEs. So take any social ill, substance abuse, heroin, addiction, take, take in homelessness, um, suicidal thoughts and ideation. And I wanna say that, right? So it's definitely correlated. But I am somebody, if, for those people who watched the film, Broken Places, it's probably why I do trauma stuff, so I'm gonna do this as a plug. Um, I have a, a score of nine. So when people talk about what helps build resiliency and what heals, I know what worked for me and other people like me. And that was all of the things that people identify as protective factors, caring school climates and environments, liking school, having neighbors who know about you and are concerned about you, having extended family network, being involved in arts and sports and those recreational activities, having parks and green space. Sounds small, right? Like, but those are the things that take an ACE score of nine and make master's degrees. And, and there are a lot of people who have a similar story. And when I hear stories of people who did make it, it wasn't just the traumas, it was the lack of the other supports that existed. So for every dollar that we don't spend in an after school program or a parks department, for kids who are experiencing adversity, it matters. And that is, you were gonna ask the question about the orchids and the dandelions. It means that kids who need more need to get the more. Uh, and, and, and so, we yeah. you know, let me right? yeah and let so me take a moment to explain that metaphor for people who may not have caught it in the film tonight. Um, in the film Broken Places, the experts they spoke with say children have profoundly different responses to trauma, as we've been discussing. Uh, the metaphor they use, they say there's two types of children: some are orchids and some are dandelions. Dandelions can thrive in almost any environment. Even when facing significant adversity, they have a determination to overcome their circumstances and succeed in life. And those are the success stories we really like to, to hear about. Um, other children, like orchids, are extremely sensitive to the environment, according to the experts in this film. Um, and under the right conditions, they can thrive, but under stress, they wilt and they don't do well. Um, Michael and Karen, I want to hear from both of you about what you think about this analogy. Do you think this is a good metaphor for understanding differences among children and the way they respond to ACEs? We're talking about adverse childhood experiences that Karen defined. Uh, Michael, let's go to you and then we can hear from others as well. I think it's not completely useless, this metaphor. It, it's interesting and it catches people's attention. And as with so many truths like it, there is a little bit of truth in it. But it's very important to not get carried away with the idea that certain children are just born tough. Stuff's just always going to roll off of them and they're going to jump up and dust themselves off. If there are kids that are jumping up and dusting themselves off by age two, I'd say already we're seeing the mixture of family relations, social support, the presence of a loving grandmother, as well as a, a little bit of genetic luck. And just to use a quick example, I work an awful lot or did with foster kids. And there is a small number of children who can have multiple foster placements and survive, excuse me, and not really survive. They develop a, a, a fairly rare but really debilitating disorder, usually referred to as reactive attachment disorder. And uh, we, we struggled for a long time to understand who those kids were. Were they just naturally not very tough when they were born? Stuff just bothered them more. And we discovered that that was really not the case at all. The kids who suffered multiple placements and did well were kids who for one reason or another stumbled across a particular foster mother or happened to have in the background a particular teacher in the third grade or a pastor that took a special interest mm -hmm. or somebody who lifted that child up and said to him, I know what you're thinking about life and I get why you think that about life and no one is ever going to love you, but you're wrong and here's how I'm going to show you that you're wrong. Whereas the child that I was talking about that develops this 
rare and very bad disorder, usually did not have anybody like that. And so their early theories about how life was going to turn out for them, from their point of view, were turning out true. They would test it and they would turn out true. Just if I can just add one other little thing. Yeah, go ahead. This is an example of why the metaphor has a little bit of truth in it. Let's say the difference between those two kids I just mentioned, the two foster kids who do well and not so well, is that one of them has a terrific smile. And let's say that that child with the terrific smile for some reason melts foster mother number two. And she turns her life over to him and will not let him run away, will not let him act out so much that she throws him away. And that kid then gets a mother for life. Whereas another child may be may come into the situation equipped the same way, just doesn't happen to have that particular kind of smile that partic- happens to grab the attention of a particular foster or adoptive mother. And he doesn't do as well. Nobody rushes to his aid. That third grade teacher can be the one that melts in the face of that child with a beautiful smile. And this is why I'm gonna stop talking, but caring schooling climates and uh, addressing structural inequities and I'm gonna say something indelicate, but racism matters because um, the research has found that kids of color, boys of color, just get negative, so much negative feedback about who they are and their place in the world and their sense of belonging. And so here we are, right? Uh, It becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy is that the behaviors that um, kids of boys of color engage in in schools get misidentified as sort of bad or violent or aggressive, and then people respond to them in kind, and then, right, becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy where we label them and encourage and judge them and punish them for um, having normal responses to stressors and not responding to them in loving and caring ways. And so all the movement around trauma-informed schools is like, hey, pay attention to these behaviors as trauma responses or stress responses and love on kids. And, And we know that that changes outcomes. The more we love on them, if we want, if we want people to be better, like offer more love, care, and kindness. So Katina, I'm just yeah. Let's yeah, yeah, Katina. I love Karen. Absolutely. Yeah, Katina, can you chime in there? Because you know we we people may have heard trauma informed schools, um, and you know Karen was mentioning how important it is to have a caring, caring school climate and address issues such as structural racism. I wonder if you can talk about how your work at um, Unit Four school districts is kind of focused on trying to address some of those issues and what that involves. Sure. We have um, several campuses that are considered trauma-informed, right? And that's, those are the campuses that are working with experts in the field around what it means to cultivate a space um, that is nurturing, um, that is, uh, holds kids accountable and meets them where they're at, right? And, and to really have that care and compassion that Karen spoke of, um, But the onus belongs to all of us when it comes to being trauma-informed. It doesn't matter if you're in the classroom. It doesn't matter if you're in the cafeteria. The onus belongs to all of us to cultivate a space um, that is welcoming for our kids. When they show up in the space, they know that they belong there. They know that they're welcomed there. Um, You don't have to have any specific training to help cultivate what we call um, a therapeutic milieu. And and really that just means that environment that's that healing space. Because when you walk in the door, you know that you're welcome. You get a good morning, Karen. How are you doing today? You get all of those things that it's not written in the curriculum. It's the hidden curriculum, right? It's how we do what we do in the space that shows our kids that we are there to support them and their growth. Um, And so that is acutely important. Um, I can't say enough about significant relationships. Um, when it comes to embracing all of our kids, but particularly our kids who have had some um, challenging lived experiences. Mm. And I think the school is an incredibly important place for kids. They spend, what, eight hours a day there sometimes? Not now, but with COVID. But um, 
the problem is we've got the school and then we have the community and the home they're living in and the neighborhood and the violence. And we have to really structure our community so that the kids are not exposed to these ACEs, you know, every day, you know, it, it seems like, you know, you go home and the clock gets reset to sure. all the bad environments they're being exposed to. So we have to fix, I think our community is schools incredibly important and part of it, but there's so much more. To, because I think the schools take the impact of this. Kids get to school, they're already revved up. Uh, they're reactive. They uh, don't process things as well. And, and they automatically go into this flight, fright kind of uh, response if they're criticized or, try, or you're trying to discipline or you're trying just to get you know, someone to uh, behave, I think, if you will, but uh, you can comment more on that, but I think you guys are set up for failure. Yeah, but you know, I, I will say that that's why it's really important, one, to be self-aware, right, to know who you are and how you um, interact in a space. It's important to be, really be self-aware as the caring and trusted adults, but it, the relationships are really important with our kids, the families that we serve, and that's why those collaborative relationships yeah are acutely important, right? I'm communicating with um, our community folks. I'm communicating with our families, right? I'm getting out there, you know, in the trenches. I'm meeting them where they're at, right? I'm not always anticipating them to come to me, but I'm in the community doing a home visit, whatever it takes to really have that continuity of care so that we ensure that what we're doing is meaningful and impactful and we're doing it with our families and not to our families. That makes a huge difference in outcomes. And I just want to add, right, so from a brain science piece, um, we don't trust strangers inherently, right? Like that's how our brains are wired. And without a relational milieu across the community where you can let your guard down, um, you're going to be more guarded. And it's harder to find a world that's trusting and loving. So part one, data shows that um, kids in uh, high-stressed environments um, Right now, it looks like kids of color in high-stressed environments, about one in six will present with the signs of complex um, trauma or complex PTSD. Uh, and that is because there are so many traumas that are happening in those neighborhoods and that we don't let up. And, and that's the kind of offer more. And that is not going to get better if we think about what we know about vets. You don't treat that through therapy alone it's making sure that there are a whole, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking because Michael's nodding, but a whole range of options and we keep acting like a referral to a therapist is going to fix, air quotes, cause there's no, right? It's gonna fix it. Instead, we know that it is, everything that we do makes a difference when we're talking about complex PTSD and complex trauma. Mm -hmm. And I wish people would stop thinking like, I'm gonna make a referral to a therapist and that's gonna be like a bullet. It's like diabetes treated just with insulin and not like a holistic plan. <laughs> you don't have to do diet, nutrition, walking, exercise. I'm just gonna do insulin. No one would say that that would be the fix. But yeah. Michael, I'd be curious what you... <laughs> Oh, I, I think I think we've done a terrible disservice. We meaning shrinks. Um, services, I think, are the enemy of children often. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is to get services or is requires often a diagnosis, mm -hmm. and a diagnosis is often the most harmful thing a child can have. It stops grown ups from being really curious about him. It stops us from being interested in how he got to be the way he is because we would prefer to just believe he is the way he is because of this acronym we pasted on him that explains it all. And I think that's very harmful and helps shut down our empathy as grown-ups, as parents, as teachers, as community members. It shuts down our empathy for kids and it shuts down our curiosity. You know, Karen, you mentioned just about kids of color in high stress environments. And I feel like it's important to discuss also, you know, as we're having this conversation, how everything our society has been going through lately ties into all of this. You know, there's of course the COVID-19 pandemic, which is claiming the lives of the lives of black Americans at more than double the rate of white Americans and 
This is not because of genetics. It's because of health inequities and racism and oppression. And then, of course, there are issues of racial injustice, police brutality against Black Americans, uh, the rate of fatal police shootings among Black Americans being much higher than that of any other ethnicity, according to a number of databases that are compiling that information. And Karen, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how all of that ties into what we're talking about when it comes to trauma and adversity in childhood. It seems like this is a particularly scary time to be a Black child. And a Black adult. Black, <laughs> black person adult. in general, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think it, it, so if we don't have, uh, if we were looking at, a, there's, there are lots of graphics that describe trauma. And one of the graphics looks at a tree, a ACEs tree, right? Not the one that, yeah. Um, and to think about uh, structural inequities, lack of opportunities, poverty, um, housing insecurity, all of those things basically are the seeding grounds for ACEs, right? Like they, we look at the symptoms on the top of the tree, like, and we're like, oh, incarceration or um, maternal depression or all of those things as just sort of being expressions of growing up in high express, uh, in high, um, high need environments. What Malcolm was hinting at, and I want to say this, is, is that not only does the environment contribute to your traumas, the things that you experience, but those traumas change you physiologically that make you more likely to get adverse health outcomes. So I think it is no small feat that both um, COVID and um and Floyd's death are both related to people not being able to breathe. And so neighborhoods that um, have environmental contaminants contribute to people having more asthma, contribute to people being more at risk for COVID. We know that stress reduces your immune system, which makes you more vulnerable to COVID. And living in a neighborhood where you don't feel safe because of either implicit bias or racism or community violence makes you not, makes you more vulnerable to diseases and it leads to health outcomes. So like, I I guess I can't stress enough, like they go like you, knowing that everything that we do matters and until we address the, the, another word is the social determinants of health or structural inequities, we will always have adverse outcomes. And if, we respond to just the symptoms and not the roots, we will always be firefighting. And so conversations about prevention and intervention and changing schools and changing law enforcement are about changing the roots. Like, um, I'm just gonna use this last one uh, because it's a great, for example, people have talked about community policing, right? There's a science behind why community policing works. If I know you, I am less likely to be afraid of you. It's very hard for me to have a a trusting relationship with people who are strangers. And so what we know is the amygdala, the flight, flight, freeze response works on both people. Law enforcement who don't have a relationship with the people they're, they're hired to serve, right? And, and youth and people in communities who don't know law enforcement, who have images about them being violent. So you've got two stressed brains coming together, trying to build relationships with each other. Inherently, that's going to be adversarial. So people have asked for reforms where law enforcement have to live in the communities in which they serve. That's a both a trauma issue, right? And a structural change issue, because if we know each other, I'm less likely to be afraid of you. Like in that, I know it sounds really like simple, but it really so is basic, like a so basic. So basic is feeling safe. If I feel safe, like you say, if I have a relationship, mm-hmm. I feel safe, but neither the police nor the person on the street feels safe. I, I think that's a real situation that has to be corrected, I think, to get any results, you know, so. Katina, I wanted to ask, yeah, thank you for that, 
Um, Malcolm, Katina, I wanted to ask, I noticed that Unit 4 put out a statement last week in solid, expressing solidarity with our Black community speaking out against systemic racism and the senseless deaths of George Floyd and many others. And I just wonder, how are schools preparing? You mentioned that you are already thinking about how to prepare to welcome students back when the time comes who have experienced the trauma of this pandemic closing schools down and how that has hurt them. I wonder how you are also thinking about preparing to support Black students who are dealing with the trauma of witnessing people who look like them and look like their family members being killed by police. Um, I, I think part of the work um, will fold nicely into the process that we actually began prior to the pandemic and really need to move with a, a, a greater sense of intentionality. And that's around our strategic planning um, process. And one piece, one of the core um, elements of that is the community engagement piece. And so I, I'm really excited about the opportunity to be at the table um, under the leadership of one of our assistant superintendents. And we have um, the, the same equity focus, or focus is very much on equity. And I, I think it's important to be at the table in the planning process, even though it's like a two to five year process, we're, we're engrossed in it now. And the process really is about bringing in community folks, bringing in voices of people in our community, um, really serving our families and our students who have been traditionally underserved. Um, and, and traditionally marginalized. So I really do see that as an avenue um, for us to really um, increase our support for our, specifically our African-American students. Um, and I really do see it being a systemic process by which we're able to incorporate, not incorporate it into our process, it's one of the core elements and that's the family and community engagement piece. So I do see that as um, a vehicle for us to really engage in the work in a way that is, um, universal across the district. Mm. I want to talk about solutions and how people who want to be a part of breaking cycles of trauma um, in our communities, what they can do to get involved. And um, I imagine there are kind of lots of places we can start, but we've been talking about um, school age children. Are there, are there, um, what help do you need Katina? Like if people are saying, you know, I want to be a part of this solution, what, what should I do? So I'm glad you asked that because when I talk about the strategic plan, I want to say we're in that process as a district, but a huge part of the success of that plan for our families is our community. Our families and um, our community partners, Healthy Beginnings. I mean, there are just so many community partners who have been on board. That's what we need. We need to continue those relationships, the things that have been put into place that have been beneficial to our families and our community. We need to keep some things in place. We need to grow some of the work and we need to have thoughtful conversations around what we need to redefine. Um, but we need our community partners at the table with us. We value um, their opinions, their expertise. And, and the thing about even um, a broader community schools approach is that no one entity can do it alone. Um, we have to have our community. We have to be in spaces where we give voice and agency to families and to folks who have traditionally not had their voices heard. We need to be in those spaces. We need to um, have our work be reflective of the people we serve. Um, and so what we need are those people who are ready to roll their sleeves up and be at the table and um, help us wrap around our families. When you all were talking about supportive relationships early in a child's life and how what a difference those can make, it made me think about mentorship programs. There are many of those in our community. That's Is that a way you'd recommend if people want to contribute, make a relationship with even one child that's consistent and that's supportive, right? I, I think so. And I think that's valuable. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there are community-based pro programs that are very valuable um, to our students because there are relationships that are constantly developing and evolving in different spaces in our community. They don't necessarily have to be in the school space to be 
um, significant, but those are the types of partnerships that I think are gonna be very important so that we can work together um, to really elevate our community. And can Dr. Hill, oh, I go know, ahead, Karen. Just a little, what we know about mentorship, because I know people love to volunteer, mm -hmm. those <laughs> who intensity matter. So mm -hmm. kids who need more, need more. So if you were hoping, because I think that funders sometimes do this, they were like, well, they had a mentor that met with them for 30 minutes during lunch. And maybe this is a kid who needs a, a mentor that's available on weekends and after school and for multiple hours. And so the research is pretty compelling. Mentoring by itself doesn't work. Like you have to do the right Absolutely. like sort of meet the need. And this mm. is where the orchid and um, dandelion metaphor work is that some kids need us to sort of be in there for the long haul. This is not like I'm in it for a semester. It's like, I'm going to be a meaningful present in a kid's life for, for their life. Mm. Right. Or for, um, I know some wonderful mentors through CU one-to-one -one mentor mentorship who just have been with kids for forever. And that's the kind of pull yourself up, you know, building relationships that make a difference. I would agree. And I, and I know that um, along those lines, Karen, I know folks who are passionate about those connections who aren't necessarily even part of a formal organized program, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think it's really going back to what you said, it's really about just meeting people where they're at. And again, just wrapping folks with um, the support necessary to help them be successful. And it's going to look different for everybody. Yeah. And Dr. And, uh, Hill, Katina I, mentioned I the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to really go back into uh, maybe another subject altogether, but, but Katina mentioned about that relationship. And I think Karen did. And with the Healthy Beginnings Program, that's kind of our theme is to meet people where they are can you talk about that program, Dr. Hill, what it, what it involves? Okay, well, the Healthy Beginners Program, we, we uh, developed a couple of years ago, and we looked at research uh, in terms of where we could get the most benefit from our time and energy, and we found this program called Nurse Family Partnership, where we would assign a nurse to a mother that's pregnant and underserved, if you will, for, you know, and we provide uh, healthcare, but more importantly, emotional, social support. Uh, if they need things in the community, we try to connect them with the you know, proper people in the community. We reduce that mom's stress when she's pregnant. Then we bring the mom through the pregnancy and, and follow the family, if you will, for the first two years uh, with regular visits and making sure that everything is done well uh, to bring a healthy kid into this world and give them the best opportunity uh, to do well. And, and I think the other thing is we connect with the community too. We work closely with the school district, really, you know, preschools head start because we don't want to just leave this family without uh, some transition. I think it's a great program. And uh, I think we've had some real success. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, trying to solve some of the problems way down the road when, if you look at that you know, information, I think early intervention in every respect, 10 to 1 pays for itself. I wish the uh, politicians would get together. And look yeah, at Dr. Hill, can you talk about that? that? The, Heckman, the, you, you were about, yes. about to mention the Heckman equation to explain Heckman how equation. these this programs guy, cost yeah, money, but you're talking about there's oh, yeah. a return on investment over time. Can you explain oh, um, right. what we know from the data on programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, Healthy Beginnings? Yes. And um, other programs think, as well. You know, I think if you just Google the Heckman Equation, it really outlines the impact of people not doing well. And it could be uh, lack of employment. It could be uh, incarceration, it could be healthcare dollars, all those things are incredible and fall back to early childhood. And I think, you know, if we can kind of get a good handle on our uh, kids when they're growing up, I think, you know, the long term benefit is there. We're not going to solve a lot of these problems in the next year or two or three. It's a long term investment in families. And, and again, healthy beginnings also stresses the importance of the family unit and surrounding that family 
uh, with the care they need. And, you know, people go, well, you know, just, you should be able to do this. Well, these, a lot of these families don't have the resources to, to really pick themselves up. And I think meeting them where they are, helping them uh, basically, you know, be who they want to be and can be, I think that's the, the key and not leaving people out to dry and expecting them to take care of all their problems. They're sometimes unsurmountable. I've heard some stories. I just, you know, just amazing. Some of the adversity, you know? Mm. Yeah. The whole idea of intervening as early as possible, even in pregnancy is just so interesting to, to, to think about how that can really have such a significant long-term effect on people's lives. Um, But, you know, Karen, I wanted to just ask, what about people who've experienced early childhood trauma and now are adults? Maybe they didn't have the interventions and the supports and the programs we've been talking about the, um, and and they're, and they're experiencing now the consequences of that trauma. What do they need to heal and to thrive? And what can we as community members do to be supportive of that healing? So this is one of the recommendations for having trauma-informed communities, right? So so first for people who have been impacted by trauma who are adults, the fact that they are here and having and waking up and trying to live their best lives, however that shows up, is a sign of growth. And we as people in community in relationship with them need to continue to remind them about that, right? That hope and recovery and growth is possible and that we're all evolving, right? And so that's, that's, and so part of, the second thing is all healing happens in the context of relationships. So every relationship that I have with somebody has an opportunity to be a healing relationship. However, when we meet people and we are hostile and negative and mean-spirited and icky, we have a chance to re-injure them. And so so trauma-informed values mean that, right? We wanna expand people's understanding of what trauma is. So we want people to know that, and then we also want languaging so that some of what you've identified as problematic sometimes is a symptom, has its roots in traumatic experiences. So that if you can recognize the symptoms of trauma, um, gonna say something parenthetically, But like, for example, people who dealt with the opioid problem, um, now that doctors who are trauma informed are more aware, they're like, we could have educated our clients better about their risk factors and said, hey, when you get an opioid, like when you take the medication, it's going to change you neurobiologically and it's going to provide you some relief that's related to your trauma. And, and people could have been better educated. Doctors could have been educated and we could have stopped it. So like changing the recognition, um, changing how people respond to people who've been impacted by trauma. Frequently we treat, we service, we demonize um, and we re-traumatize people. So that, and then the last part is we wanna avoid re-traumatizing people. And that to me, um, all the work around trauma-informed care actually existed within help. It started in like working with people who were homeless because they realized that frequently people got hurt in helping situations. So that re-traumatization is super important because well-meaning people will like design a trauma-specific treatment. They'll have a therapy, they'll have an intervention, but it'll be delivered in a way that's harmful Um, And and I'm going to say, so I always use this as an example. Imagine I have the best trauma therapist on the planet. They are just great and amazing. But I walk out and the receptionist at the front desk is a grumpy, mean-spirited person and dehumanizes me. And then I walk out and I have to guard up because I am walking past people who say sexually inappropriate things or maybe mean spirited things to me. And then I have to take two buses and then I have food insecurity. The best trauma therapist can't undo all of the environmental things that were not trauma informed. And so I ask for and advocate for trauma informed places so that 
it's done, everything that's done is done in a holding environment that is loving, relational, and healing that takes in account the whole, not just the treatment. Because again, good therapists, and we keep creating new ones in the absence of an environment that is loving and whole, like that makes sure that you have food and safety and love and care, right? We've got we to gotta think about the whole. And that your kids also have it, right? Like you've got to think about you as a whole family, as a whole community. So, yeah. Michael, did I say anything wrong? <laughs> I'm with you. We just have a few minutes left, and I wanted to give each person on our panel tonight an opportunity to just share one or two action items um, that they would recommend people take um, who would like to be a part of the solution, to be a part of breaking cycles of trauma, promoting healing in their local communities. So let's start with, uh, let's start with you, Michael. Um, what are some suggestions you have for people who are listening tonight? Well, you're gonna get an awfully unpsychological response from me about this question tonight, because what's on my mind, perhaps provoked a little bit by this discussion, are the practical things we can do in our neighborhoods. And to me, that means things that I grew up with. Uh, it means um, calling out to a child that walks by your house every day and um, um, telling some child you know that you love them. Um, taking cookies to some lady down the street that you haven't heard from in a little while that you know is cooped up in there with three kids. Um, it means hearing about, you know, you know what happens to a kid who starts acting up in school? They get referred usually, and pretty soon there's psychometric testing, and pretty soon there's a diagnosis, and pretty soon there's a big meeting called that we refer to as an IEP, where a whole bunch of people sit around and criticize. They don't say they're doing that, but that's what it amounts to. Criticize the child and criticize the parent for being the parent of such a child as this. Um, what if you were the neighbor of such a child and you heard about an IEP and you bullied your way into that room? They won't invite you, but you have to find a way to get in there. And you say out loud in that room, I don't know about all these diagnoses you're giving this boy, but I can tell you that when his mama was real sick last year, I saw him walk past my house every day with a real sad look on his face. And I feel awful bad that I did not reach out to him and that ends right here. So I, I wanna give him a job. I need my leaves raked and I got some extra money and I, got, uh, I need some help with baking some brownies and I'm gonna stand up for this kid. Those are the kind of practical things in our neighborhood that are coming to my mind tonight. Mm. Dr. Hill, I wanted to hear from you, your thoughts, action steps for people. Oh. Mm. So many things. Uh, I think just mm -hmm. getting involved in the community, whether it be, uh, you know, helping with healthy beginnings or being more informed about what trauma is and how it affects you so that you're a little more patient the next time you interact with someone that's having difficulty. Maybe ask them what's going on instead of what's wrong with you. And, you know, I think those are really important points. Uh, I, I, I really think whether, you know, it's the food bank or whatever we need to support people that are experiencing adversity, you know? Uh, and I think it's like you say, it's housing, nutrition, it's all those things, uh, getting politically involved, but more of that, I think letting our local politicians, state politicians, it's frustrating. I, I, I'm not sure how we're gonna get where we need to be, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. being more involved more visible. Katina, how about you? Anything you'd add to the list? Uh-oh, you're muted. Oh, Katina, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. I, I <laughs> am willing to um, stretch beyond the status quo, right? Being willing to stand in the gaps and be those advocates and to really value um, meeting the needs of the whole child, the whole family, whole community, um, whatever that looks like, and, and being a willing partner at the table 
um, reaching out, being willing to um, collaborate and partner at a greater degree than we've ever done before. Um, we have some strong relationships, but we need more. Um, we need to um, increase those relationships and have folks at the table so that we can work together um, and not in our silos. So um, just being willing to stretch beyond that which is comfortable and have the difficult conversations because one of the things, and then to action out the things that we say we value because we know inaction is very costly and we've seen the outcome of that. Karen, anything you'd like to add or fill in the gaps, final thoughts as we wind down tonight? So, you know, want to say again, thank WILL so much for hosting this. I didn't want the showing up broken places to happen without a conversation about resiliency. Uh, and I encourage people to find the Trauma and Resiliency Initiative. We're one place where we see ourselves operating like a collaborative. So um, we have communities of practice looking at things like trauma-informed schools and working in to improve our cross system collaboration. Um, we offer support to people who've been impacted by, by trauma and, and violence. And so we, one of our commitments to the community is we have a growing together in tough times group for um, young moms and for essential workers. And I guess I, I wanna say like everything that we do, we try to make it a we. Uh, and so we encourage folks to connect with us, ask us to help, ask us to come into your organization, your group, your program. If you want to be more trauma informed, come and collaborate with us because uh, as Michael said so eloquently, like reaching out to, to neighbors, being more connected to each other is the key. And the last thing that I want to say is um, there are some people who've heard that we every year, a couple times a year, we offer training called Healing Solutions. And if you want to know how to be that neighbor, to go to a school and advocate, if you want to go and reach out, particularly in COVID, if you want to know how to take care of each other better, every year we offer training. It is completely free. We offer it virtually. People have used words like wrap around a lot. We teach you how to do that. It's not sophisticated. But mm -hmm. we, and we all, we do that as a gift because we're funded by the mental health, per, because we want to support the community's ability to take care of each other because we're all in this together. And I think if we've learned nothing about the last three months is that we all have to be empowered to love on each other better, to deal with both individual traumas, but also intergenerational traumas. because Some of this stuff has been around for a long time. And um, so I thank you for the time and the space and the ability to have this conversation and everybody who joined us because this has been <laughs> phenomenal. So, yeah. And thank you all for being so generous with your time you. um, and being here, sharing your insights. And thank you for the work you do in our community to support healing. Karen Sims is the director of the CU Trauma and Resiliency Initiative. You can find their Facebook page um, for all uh, the information that Karen was just explaining. Um, Dr. Malcolm Hill is a retired pediatrician from Carl Hospital. He's also on the board of the CU Trauma and Resiliency Initiative. Katina Wilcher, Director of Student, Family, and Community Engagement at Unit 4 Schools, and Michael Trout, Director of the Infant Parent Institute. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.